never no more. Folks tell me where the good times go. I heard the curb all day, can't even sell a bag, it's so slow. My ass is slow, still roll up with some flames in the trouble. Folks was a chameleon of sorts. To many, he was like a Robin Hood giving to the poor. To the police, he was nothing more than a drug dealing gangster who would stop at nothing, even murder, to protect his empire. Fluky Stokes' violent death was consistent with a life full of corruption, dope dealing, and murder. Fluky wanted people to believe his diamonds, cars, and cash came from Lady Luck. I'm a gambler. Ah, shoe poo, dice. Maybe in the beginning, but nine years ago, he traded in his dice and cards for cocaine and heroin. And Willie Fluky Stokes built a drug empire that left nothing to chance. Unit 5 has learned that Fluky's drug empire was making more money than anyone ever imagined. Authorities now believe his empire was grossing a million dollars a week. That's more than 50 million dollars a year. Confidential federal drug enforcement documents obtained by Unit 5 reveal how big Fluky's organization was. Fluky was trying to hire hitman James Allen as an enforcer to protect his drug organization. At that time, according to DEA documents, Fluky showed him 22 kilos of heroin worth more than $60 million. That was at just one stash house. Fluky had an endless supply of cocaine and heroin, and he established a drug messenger service consisting of 30 to 50 runners who could deliver his drugs anywhere in the city 24 hours a day. His runners were equipped with beepers, like this one on Gordon Battle's attache case. Unit 5 has learned that Fluky gave his runners only two ounces of dope at any time. Fluky limited the amount of dope he had on the street for a number of reasons. First, he could limit his losses if any of his runners got caught by the police, and he could keep better track of his dope supply if he gave everyone the same amount. And finally, he wouldn't give anyone any more dope until they paid for the dope they already sold. Fluky never handled the dope. He handled the money. And this man, Earl Wilson, started giving drug investigators an idea of just how much money Fluky was making and how much dope he was pushing on the streets. Wilson became an undercover operative for the police, and he documented six weeks of Fluky's activities. Here at 121 East 47th Street, Fluky set up office and counted his dope money, which was brought to him in gym bags, briefcases, and paper sacks. For example, Unit 5 has learned that on October 23rd, he counted as much as $200,000. On October 28th, he counted $60,000 from just one money runner, and on November 1st, three runners gave Fluky money. One of the bags contained $40,000. This man, Big Bill Hill, was Fluky's right-hand man. Pictured here in better days, his fingers were covered with diamonds and his hands stuffed with cash. On October 5th, 1983, he was caught with 134 packets of cocaine and heroin. Until he was put out of business, prosecutors say he alone made $100,000 a week for Fluky's organization. And the money just rolled into Big Bill from the street people, who in turn rolled it into Fluky's... Fluky would try to eliminate his competition any way he had to. On the street, it might mean murder. In the police department, it meant bribes. On May 26, 1984, at a barber shop on the south side, Leroy Dixon was gunned down, shot in the head. He tried to move in on Fluky's drug turf. Last January, on Merrill Street, Lavert Handy made the same mistake. He wanted to sell dope in Fluky's area. He ended up with a shotgun blast in the back of his head. On July 30th, in this parking lot, Anthony Brown was killed. He made the fatal mistake of robbing one of Fluky's runners and then refusing to return the money. For that, he was shot through the heart. Police say the man behind these murders was Willie Fluky Stokes. He was trying to protect his multi-million dollar drug empire, so he simply had his competition eliminated, according to police. James Delaney is commander of Area 1. We think he did do anything to protect his empire. We think that he made his money dealing in drugs. Uh, we think he protected his interests uh, any way he had to, and if it led to murder, so be it. Fluky's criminal record spans a quarter century, arrested more than 60 times. Charges range from drug violations to murder. But since 1978, Fluky's life in crime seemed to come to a halt, even though his drug business was more profitable than ever. Unit 5 has learned while some police officers were working hard trying to put Fluky behind bars, others were on his payroll, secretly feeding him police reports and other inside information. It was after the funeral of Fluky's son, Willie the Wimp, that police got the surprising news. Fluky's informers penetrated the police department's detective division at Area 1. 
Stokes had been stopped by Las Vegas police while on a gambling junket at Caesar's Palace. He was caught with Chicago mm -hmm. police mugshots of the suspects in his son's murder. Police tell Unit 5 it was not uncommon for Flukey to have stacks of confidential police reports. On raids or uh, when search warrants were executed in the past, uh, it would not be unusual to find police reports uh, in Flukey's possession. Did that surprise you as a prosecutor? Well, Flukey would have no real good reason to have police reports uh, unless he's trying to take care of his people. Drug investigators from the Cook County State's Attorney's Office through an undercover informant learned that Flukey had a lot of friends on the police department. Flukey would often spot police officers on the street and tell his bodyguards not to worry because, quote, they're my friends. Flukey suggested that if the police department had special details working late at night, he knew when they were out, where they were working, and who they were. Knowing that kind of information enabled Flukey to stay away from the police and to keep his empire operating without interference. He attempted to pay off police officers for police reports and we believe other things. We believe he was making an attempt to own the entire Chicago Police Department. Exclusively that police are concerned about a possible drug war because three different big time dealers would like to take over where Flukey left off. When Willie Flukey Stokes was buried, the head of the largest single independent drug operation in Chicago history was laid to rest. But the body of his drug empire is still alive and thriving and in turmoil. There appears to be three groups muscling for control of Flukey's $50 million a year drug network. One group is headed by Gordon Battle, Flukey's former partner. Another by Chuck McFerrin, Flukey's arch enemy. And the third by Sam Love Jr., Flukey's former associate. The struggle for control of Flukey's well-entrenched drug turf started, and members of Flukey's organization were brutally gunned down. Narcotics investigator Tom Shinnick. And they're vicious and violent enough that they would um, protect themselves at all costs. Unit 5 has learned that shortly before Flukey was murdered, a new cartel of independent drug dealers was formed, and he began to fear a major drug war was imminent. On November 10th, at this restaurant, Flukey met with this man, Chuck McFerrin. Police theorize that McFerrin is the self-appointed leader of the new cartel. Also at that meeting, Pedro Rodriguez, a man police consider to be a major supplier of cocaine and heroin to Chicago drug dealers. Rodriguez, believed to have organized crime connections in New York, Detroit, and South Florida, may have made a pact to deal only with the new cartel. The cartel is expected to take any action to gain control of Flukey's lucrative drug empire. And the big question is, how much is Gordon Battle willing to give up? Battle, known as Chip on the street, is Flukey's heir apparent. Battle lives in a fortress-like house on the far south side of the city. He was Flukey's partner for the last few years. Another group police believe could emerge as a major source of drugs is the Love family. Police discovered evidence of the Love's big-time drug business on January 19th, when narcotics agents raided this Alsop apartment house and confiscated more than a half million dollars in drug money. The cash, in mostly 10s and 20s, belongs to Sam Love Jr. The street has been relatively quiet since Flukey was murdered, but police say trouble could erupt at any time, because in the drug business, takeovers are generally not friendly. Despite extensive criminal histories, none of these men have been convicted of serious drug offenses. Unit 5 has learned that federal drug agents have been investigating the Flukey drug network for three years. And we have also learned that IRS was on the verge of indicting the flamboyant drug dealer for tax evasion at about the time he was killed. 